have a lot of passion for what you're doing. This rings true because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, and if you're not having fun doing it, you're gonna give up. Welcome to another episode of John's Entitled Podcast, a partner of MoshPitNation.com. This episode's guest is Chimera's own Mark Hunter, vocalist. Uh, and Mark comes on to talk about his documentary uh, called Down Again. It just came out recently. And coming on the show recently again is Daniel Terry. How are you doing? Well, I'm doing pretty good, man. Uh, things are looking up. Yeah, it... Uh... It was a lot of fun uh, getting to talk to Mark about his documentary. Um, I was kind of hoping we'd get to talk to him before the documentary came out. Um, but actually, I kind of think it works a little bit to our advantage to kind of do something with something already being out. Because then as opposed to people hearing things and not having any context to what we're talking about, now they're able to watch something and go back and listen to these these interviews that Mark has done with all the various uh, outlets. And to me, I think it's kind of cool to be you know, some of the media that gets to do something where I think there's this big cultural significance between, you know, the metal music scene and, you know, some of these more serious mental health issues that, you know, obviously affect a lot of us. And mm -hmm. I know, sadly, you know, you weren't able to do this chat with me, but I know, you know, in talking with you, this was something kind of that, you know, you were looking forward to kind of being a part of. So I guess, you know, now would kind of be a good, uh, as good of time as any, really, to to kind of let you kind of have the floor and kind of talk to you, kind of talk to what this film meant, what you kind of gleamed from it, and all that kind of stuff. Well, I mean, I I haven't been too shy about this on podcasts um, over the last two years. That I, uh, I I'm a strong um, supporter of mental illness awareness, you know. Um, because I have suffered from very similar symptoms um, to what Mark was talking about with the uh, with the uh, hypomania and, and stuff like that. Now I don't have an I'm not on medication or diagnosis, but I totally I totally understand the um, the hyperactivity part of it and how that can wear you down into a husk of a human being over time. And um, so it was it was interesting hearing him talk about that. And, um, I have to admit, I kind of wish that the, that the movie had been a little bit more mental illness and less chimera. Um, if I'm allowed to say that, uh, <laughs> but, uh, th that was my only criticism from it. But I thought, I thought the idea of, um, of having kind of a prominent, um, band, you know, chimera, you know, for the longest time were everywhere. You know, and um, so to have have the awareness and have and have a, a singer that, you know, is, is relatively well known, at least in, in metal um, to, to sit down and actually talk about um, talk about mental illness in, in a more more candid and realistic way. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I got a lot out of it from from that perspective, things that I can relate to and um, have struggled with myself. I think it's a really good um, I think it's a really good documentary if you're somebody that can, that can identify personally with what's going on. Um, but I do think that, you know, if you're here just for chimera, you're going to get that. But, um, it's kind of funny, like in, and John, you mentioned it on the interview a little bit, you know, you're like, some people are like, wow, yeah, this really, you know, this really affected me positively. And then other people are like, where's the rest of that live show, bro. So like the people, <laughs> that, the people that are only there for chimera, uh, don't get enough of it. And the people that uh, the people that are there for mental illness feel like they don't get enough of it, you know. Yeah, it uh, it was kind of interesting in talking with him. I don't know. Sometimes, like, and you know, I kind of made comments about like, oh, I was I was trying to find different parallels to to analogies that I was trying to come up with, thinking that there was maybe more there, and, and maybe some of it was, was actually kind of rooted in, in purpose there, but I think as a whole, it was kind of a bit disconnecting for me to see so much of the Chimera DVDs interspersed in the DVD, because it almost felt like, 
and you know mark kind of made a comment about how this is kind of a very diy low budget in all sense of the word uh project which most documentaries are but it was just one of those where it just kind of was like okay like are you showing me these clips because they're supposed to they're gonna tie to something related to your the the mental you know the the bipolar stuff and like all this other things you know what is it or is it just you know gap filler yeah i and i wondered that whenever i was watching it you know like if i could be totally honest about it that i um i definitely went into it thinking it was going to be different than what i got yeah um however that's not a bad thing um but i because i like chimera it's not like a it's not like an unhappy distraction right and you know just the idea of the band getting together again after a long time and doing doing a show and you know so i mean that that part of it you know the fan in me is like yeah this is great this is great um and like i said i i definitely like the dvd more for what it represents more so maybe than the actual content of the dvd itself if that makes sense yeah like i, I would hope that this would spur other artists to come forward with their uh with their with these types of issues and because it, one thing one thing that i really like about how um how he describes all of this is that he's like i'm not on medication i i'm not in a severe depressive mode you know i'm not um and i don't have a i like i really liked whenever he said you know he's like i really don't have a success story for this stuff right it's not like i've gotten over it i still struggle with it um and that 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 really affected me positively because I I'm very much the same way. Like the hyper, like just the hyperactive activity, like working for long stretches of time without stopping. And like, it's like, and with me personally, I think a lot of it is I take on a lot of projects that like, I just can't finish, you know, like I can't, um, I, I, I'm more of a say yes to everything and try to please everybody. And then, you know, I end up disappointing people and then I get depressed because I disappointed people because I you, like it, it's a never ending cycle. And just it makes me feel better knowing I'm not the only one that does that. Right. <laughs> you know, there, there's a little bit of solace in knowing that other people are struggling with this as well. Um, and it sounds it sounds kind of jerkish to say, like, my biggest weakness is that I'm an overachiever. But like, no, it's like an actual legitimate problem. Like if you can't realistically deliver on results you, you know or you can't re deliver on your promises th that can lead to a lot of you know self-doubt and really in the end make you not want to do anything right you know yeah so yeah I, I dug it and i related to it so i mean mission accomplished yeah i think with the thing you know and, and having watched it again after doing this chat and then in listening to this chat to kind of edit some of it out to kind of make it flow a little better you know, I think the thing maybe that this was for and that I, you know, maybe you and I in talking about it didn't latch on to was maybe this is more as just kind of a starting point to have the conversation, not to have all the answers and, and kind of walk you through everything. And when I kind of watched it through that lens, I think it definitely achieves that. But like, like I said, I think you and I, because of being Chimera fans and, you know, getting this all encompassing DVD with long form interviews and seeing the struggles of everybody and having fights and all this kind of stuff, you know, it kind of speaks to like what Mark was saying about having those, you know, train wreck style, you know, intervention type things. And that's not what this is. And to me, it's like, once I kind of looked at it more as being, you know, the beginning, the start of something, it's like, okay, like, I think that makes gives you a completely different approach to it, and then I think as a result, that's what doing these these interviews and such has done is m allowed the conversation to keep going and been more of a companion piece. Yeah, um, I think uh, we've we've talked enough about the, uh, the preamble, as it were, for this. So let's get into my chat with Mark Hunter of Chimera, and we'll talk to you afterward. <laughs> So 
So I had the pleasure this evening of talking with Mark Hunter, vocalist for Chimera, as most of you may know, but more importantly, he just put out a documentary called Down Again. You may have seen it thanks to the uh, marketing done by Hope for the Day, as well as, uh, you know, some financial backing done by the folks over at the Cleveland Centers for Family and Children. And if you recognize the director's name, Mr. Nick Cavalier, it might be because you might have seen the Force Perspective documentary that he did for Derek Hess a few years ago. All that aside, we have Mark on to talk about the documentary. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, I got to say, I was pretty excited to uh, to see this when you know the email came across my inbox a while back before the the documentary was actually released, and I think you know with good cause because uh, you know the, the Chimera went away, but I think something that really was a great value to us as fans and, and to I think you guys as the band itself was the documentaries that you always included in almost every release that you did. And so it was. It kind of felt like, oh, I get to I get to hang out with my friend again. I get to see what Mark's been up to since the the band went away. How did this whole project kind of come about? That's a good question. So, um, in Cleveland, we have a festival called Acting Out, and it was a mental health and substance abuse festival that Derek Hess put on, you mentioned a few moments ago. And the producer, Marty, contacted me and asked if I could get Chimera back together and would we be interested in playing the festival. And I had known that we were going to perform our Christmas show and so we hadn't let the cat out of the bag yet, though. So I had to decline and because it would have been a conflict. But I, I thought, wow, that's a pretty unique concept for a festival. And they had comedians, musicians, artists, photographers. And I just wanted to be a part of it. So I mentioned that I was clinically diagnosed with hypomania, and which is a form of bipolar and it's kind of referred to as CEO disease where you're not requiring hospitalization, but you have a tendency to act like Steve jobs from time to time. <laughs> so, um, we did this, uh, you know, they, they asked me to be a part of, uh, you know, speaking about uh, on a speaking panel with the director, Nick, who also had bipolar and then they wanted it to be moderated by a trained professional. So that's where Dr. Patrick Runnels, who's also in the film comes into play. And we spent about an hour and a half talking about various mental health and creativity conversations, answered questions from people in the audience. And it's just a good, good time. And few weeks later, Nick and I went out for beer and a burger, if you will. And he said, hey, let's turn this into a a short film and center it around your reunion show and whatnot. Because by this point, the cat was out of the bag. So I was like pretty apprehensive at first. And because uh, on one hand, I'm used to seeing in documentaries the intervention type where you have the guy huffing Lysol, going crazy. That's not me. And uh, so people like watching a train wreck. I know it. So <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I didn't really have much to offer in that realm. And then I'm not the triumphant story either. I don't have this great success story where... I've radically changed my life and I'm a multimillionaire now and all these things. I mean, I'm just some dude that is kind of in between. So, um, but then you kind of take a step back from that and you think, well, that is actually kind of interesting. It's more of a recovery story and the, the challenges of not only the past, but what you have to face in the future and how you're dealing with the present. And it can be very allegorical. It doesn't have to be just about me. It could be about anybody. And bonus, I get this 
killer footage of the reunion show and me getting to hang out with my friends who I haven't seen in, on stage in seven years. That's a win-win for me. So it starts a conversation and we get some great Camaro DVD footage like you mentioned. I'd love being able to catalog those moments in our lives. And then uh, if it helps somebody at the end of the day, then wow. So here we are. The thing that was kind of interesting to me, and, you know, I don't, I, I try not to do a whole lot of research anymore as far as like the other interviews you may have done because I don't want that. Almost like when you're recording a record, you don't want to listen to a bunch of music because it might seep into what you're doing. So sure. with that said, you know, if, if this has been asked a handful of times, and then I for, forgive me for that. But, uh, you know, I was wondering, you know, this sounds like other than, you know, the the nucleus of this being centered around like, hey, we'd like Chimera to come play this this thing. Was there a little trepidation on your end to include the band in any of this, in, in the way that it kind of ended up being presented as a whole? From the get-go, I asked if they were comfortable with it and cool with it, and then mentioned what it was going to be about. And they were more than welcome to give interviews if they wanted to or be in front of the camera or not be in front of the camera. Just let me know. And everyone was really cool. I think we could have seen a little more interviews from and other perspectives from other members if we would have had the, the time and the, the timing just wasn't right. The way uh, Nick and his film crew, they, they kind of came in as we're rehearsing and it takes a bit to, set it all up and make a interview scene look good and this and that. And then you got to pull a guy away for an hour and it's just, it just the timing wasn't right. And then the next time we see him, it's the day of the show. Right. Nobody really wants to be pulled away. So, um, I got pulled away. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, everyone was really supportive of it. They thought it was an interesting idea and, it seems that everyone's pretty supportive still now having seen the film and um, very thankful Rob uh, from our band took uh, his time to mix the live album and, or not album, excuse me, live tracks for, no, that wasn't a Freudian slip to all the community fans. Like, oh, he's going to, you heard that? <laughs> and he, he, just, he just mixed a few live songs for us and, um, did a killer job so I'm very thankful for that as well you know and of course you get to see Jim and he's just never one to turn away from the camera <laughs> <laughs> yeah I enjoyed that scene but you know it's funny because and I don't know if I was thinking a little beyond just what I was looking at but in that scene where you know you're getting your hair touched up you know by Jim it kind of was one of those things where it, it worked on a different level to me because it's like the barbershop is like one of those places where men and, you know, I think you, if I remember correctly, I think you kind of hit on this where it's like, you know, you, how do you start having this conversation with yourself about these things or with people? And to me, it's like the barbershop has always been one of the few or even a salon for, for women more predominantly, but you know, you, old TV shows that took place in like in the fifties and stuff. It's like, that's where all the men would talk about things. Uh, right. in, in some, in some instances you could even say like some people would probably agree that that's where men learned how to become men because of like the, the life advice you would get from your elders and so forth. So to me, it, it kind of played to that parallel where I was like, well, of course they're going to have an interview in a barbershop because that's kind of where people are more at ease and more comfortable in talking to one another for some reason. Um, but I, like I said, I don't know if I was just putting all of this extra context on something where it was just like, no, Jim works at a barbershop. I needed my hair done. And that was just a way to kill two birds with one stone. Uh, a little bit of everything because what well, Jim is a barber. Yes. Jim just is now running his first barbershop. So of course we're like stoked to promote that for him. And, uh, but yeah, that is a place and that is a place like Jim has been cutting my hair since I was well, probably 18 years old and how much we've 
learned. And yeah, we would sit there and listen to the old guys either bust balls on people. <laughs> you learn how to bust balls. That's what you learn. Yeah. That's what you're reminding me when you said that of the movie Grand Torino. And yep. He, he, he sort of asked his neighbor to go right into the barber shop, basically to learn how to be a man. Like you hit it right. Like that's exactly what happens there. He learns how to buzz balls. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it's a little of everything. You know, I kind of wanted to. I mean, we've we've mentioned Derek Hess by name a few times now in this chat. Something I, I've kind of wondered, and I, you know, I went and listened back to the conversation I had with him, just you know, to see if there were any parallels. Maybe I could pull from something that's kind of interesting and i know neither of you i don't think you live technically in cleveland specifically between either of you but i know i think you're like 45 minutes away or 30 minutes away um but that being said in the dvd itself and down again and even in your band's dvds over the years it always seems like there's this sense of bleakness that you (laughs) almost wear with like a, a badge like a pride like yeah, we're from here, and it's dark, and it's dreary, and it's bleak as fuck, and we somehow figured out how to make it out of here. But I often wonder if there's the flip side of that, where as a result of all that, like that kind of gets you down a little bit more than maybe if you lived in, you know, a, a sunnier place at times. Yeah, I, I can't stand it. Like, I'm not gonna lie, but there's like this weird. There's something in the water. It's keeping me here. It must be it. I mean, we have great tap water. I don't know. Um, Stockholm the, Syndrome is the only thing I kept rely, like, <laughs> relating it to. And I was like, I don't know if that yeah. applies, but. Uh, you might be right. You might be onto something. Um, yeah, it's like it, but it, in real life, like right now, of course, the sun is going down a little earlier and there's just less hours in the day. And that always puts a uh, puts me in a funk. Like, I don't like waking up when it's, dark um i i get anxiety because it's i don't know i feel like the walls are closing in or something like uh i'm I'm never going to see light again or it's just bizarre i don't like it um i wish we lived somewhere sunny and then but on the same token this is like where everyone was was family that kind of sort of thing so i've been here for quite some time but all i know right it kind of made me wonder too i mean outside of maybe doing like the stress fest and stuff like that have you ever collaborated with derek on anything or i mean it seems like now in light of this documentary and both of them being done by nick it would almost seem like should pair up with him and, and start doing things even if it's just local to like the ohio area but i feel like the whole time i was watching this i was like oh i feel like derek and Nick and, and Mark could probably lead a, a pretty interesting like conversation to bring a lot of awareness to this this you know these things that revolve around mental diseases and disorders and so forth. Um, but I didn't know if like that had ever been anything that had been presented to you or that either of you guys had thought of. Well, I was a fan of Derek's growing up. He was a flyer maker, and for all the bands that would play the Euclid Tavern, and I just always would collect them and man, that artwork is awesome and I always just appreciated it posters that he would make for tours and like once, once he got more notor- more, excuse me more notoriety um, and then we asked him to make I think it was Camera Christmas 6 Camera Christmas 6 in 2005 <laughs> it always we, I remember that because we always had that weird little Thing. But yeah, uh, and then um, moving forward, uh, we have not discussed anything, and there wasn't any sort of plan. But yeah, it would be pretty cool. I'd love to perhaps capture some kind of unique way of what he does, you know. But yeah, that's a good idea. You you might be a matchmaker here. <laughs> Um, you know, the documentary is out at this point and 
sadly, it seems that the common thing that I'm seeing in the in the event, not the event page, jeez, Facebook culture, in the uh, comment section is a lot of people just going like, well, where's the rest of that live show at? <laughs> so is it a little disheartening that you put out this documentary and there's a way bigger message behind it, but seemingly people are only focused on this like 2% of what it actually has contained within it? Uh, I do. I I look at it all kind of the same. I think that we we get a lot of private messages that are pretty mind blowing, and I've been happy to see people comment openly as well. Um, really heartfelt stuff and what the film did for them. But I'm also equally as pleased to see that they want to hear more music and they want to see the live show and they're interested still in the band. I understand where you're coming from, where it seems a bit petty in the grand scheme of things. Is petty even the right word? I don't know. But uh, I digress. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, um, I think, you know, I'm just happy they're commenting at all and excited about it. So, um, you know, luckily, I mean, could, the comments could be way worse. I mean, if the worst, quote unquote, we're getting is, where, where's the rest of the song, man? <laughs> and I'm cool. I'm cool with that. <laughs> you know, something that I thought was interesting. Obviously, the title of the documentary is is off of a of a Chimera song, and it made me wonder in going through this documentary, and obviously with it being tied around the Chimera Christmas, the first time the the band had gotten together for a while. You know, I I. I gotta figure out how I want to ask this to the, where it makes sense. Um, so, I would assume you obviously haven't known you've had this disorder this whole time you've been in the band. But out of curiosity, have maybe in preparing for the Chimera Christmas, have you gone back and looked at some of the lyrics you've written and just kind of redissected them? Now understanding, you know, sort of the, how you are now as far as like with this disorder and so forth and, and maybe kind of looking at oh I, I guess I kind of had talked about it way back then and just didn't know I was expressing these feelings like I didn't know where they were coming from um I feel like I I guess I look at hypomania as a different situation I, I I'm pretty cognizant always of what I'm writing about where it's coming from and what my in touch with my feelings but being clinically diagnosed with something that's more or less a term to properly categorize which types of symptoms I experience. And a lot of those symptoms are um, almost, I like the, using the word soup, make me superhuman okay. because they're, they're in, increased energy and uh, focus and, uh, flooded with ideas and so it, it, it this is the type of thing like you know uh, I just recently discovered this which is funny to use the word discover but Christopher Columbus had hypomania and so well, it's going to take some kind of nut to steer a ship <laughs> off a of flat earth <laughs> you need these types of the, these types of like grand grandiose behavior right and that's what it gives me the uh the things that we would like look on uh, you know but but it also was followed by depressive states where things you know life just is kind of pointless and you have to kind of make get that energy ramped up again it's just when it gets too ramped up then you're like uh, almost thinking like you're alexander the great <laughs> Which you're not, and uh, you know, and then the lows, you know, you're just <clears throat> trying to force yourself out of bed, but you'd rather uh, order a large pizza and well, skim Netflix, not even watch anything, and just be depressed and not want to do fuck all. So I could either take on 500 projects at once and kill them, or don't bother me for a week. So that's kind of where I've always had a, a, a 
like I understood that that's what I was, but I didn't understand what it meant. And certainly not being properly diagnosed, I was put on occasionally medications that either just were completely ineffective or, or made me uh, a little too ramped up or a little too low. You know, they just exasperated symptoms. So, Well, I'm sure being um, in a would, yeah. touring band probably didn't help any of those symptoms either. <laughs> No, and, and that's the thing. It's kind of like thinking of it as like if, if you're if you're if you're ramped up. This is kind of weird being a musician for touring all over the world for 17 years, but I have never physically seen cocaine. So I've never <laughs> seen this drug in my presence in my life. But I imagine when I'm in a hypomanic state, people would assume I'm like coked up or like really high on dopamine or like because then you're extremely moody and irritable as well. So if you're in a touring band, your senses are heightened. You're, you know, everything is a little more heightened. So you're experiencing it probably a little more heightened than the rest of the people around you. Um, so if you're fearing something, then you're going to make everyone else panic. But <laughs> right. <laughs> you, you, you know what I mean? Your, your energy is kind of infectious to those that you're surrounding. If you have, uh, if you're not even killed like everyone else around you. <clears throat> well, I think, you know, in watching the documentary, it kind of made me think back to some of the other band DVDs and stuff when, you know, seemingly you would kind of mention some of the symptoms, I guess. But I never really knew if it was just like, you know, tour fatigue, being, you know, alone from, you know, being over in Europe and something happens back home or whatever. So it was kind of trying to make me almost go back and, and rewatch those DVDs like in a new light of being like, Oh, okay. Like I, you know, as you said, mi being misdiagnosed, it's like, okay. Like, so was some of the feelings and some of the things that you were describing, you know, 10 plus years ago, is that the beginning signs of it that you just didn't know what it was. Um, so it was kind of interesting trying to go back through and, and try to find that maybe or talk about it or see if it was, yeah. that's what it was. We were definitely trying to find it and trying to figure it out, especially you mentioned 10 years ago, uh, losing my mind was like a, an experience I was having negatively on the one, a prescription medication that didn't work. Um, so yeah, there's, there's hints of it kind of littered out, but uh, as, as far as like when I, got the hypomania diagnosis it was already out of the band so i think we were always trying to treat the depressive side right but i didn't really realize that the ups were a bad thing <laughs> usually well, it's, not it's probably not necessarily a bad thing but yeah. you know what i mean they can be they can be at times um you know kind of the documentary at the end kind of showcases your penchant for photography that you've you've picked up and, you know, having followed you for a while on Twitter now, I, I, what I, this is more of a, just a personal question. Do you do more like photography for fun or is it like, I, I guess I can't really figure out exactly what realm of photography you're in. Like, do you do commercial photography as well? So I, I, when I started my journey with photography, I, was getting good feedback online when I would post my work and uh, you know that's kind of cool obviously but I, I I was like well I'll scroll down and then like maybe see a photo that's not very well done and people still give positive feedback regardless right and I'm like ah, I don't want this <laughs> kind of reassurance because it's it's it could be false so i wanted to just kind of develop myself as a photographer that worked around the area i i, I started taking anything and everything i could get i wanted to be anonymous as possible so you know starting on things like thumbtack joining networking groups joining chambers of commerce um just kind of getting to know everyone around here hired a business coach or not hired but i found one that was volunteer through a program called score and just kind of took it seriously like okay i like photography i like taking pictures i like 
making money and whoa, I can make a lot of money on photography, <laughs> especially compared to a band. And I don't have to share with anybody. Woo! <laughs> no managers, no agents, nothing. Just me. Awesome. This is going to be fun. But of course, it takes years to get there. So uh, I'm in the trenches for still, I consider myself um, in the trenches, but I mainly do uh, commercial work. So I'll, I'll link up with a business, for example. Um, I'll, I'll just give you the history of my first one. I was uh, uh, a supporter and shopper of a local butcher shop called Jaworski Meats. They've been around 80 plus years. And I go in there every week. That's where I get my food. And I uh, was recognized by one of the butchers for being in Camara, And of course, I'm just kind of fresh out of Camara, So I'm like, yeah, I don't really want to talk about that. <laughs> uh, so, hey, can we talk about the meat? Can I, can I take pictures of it? I'm a photographer, blah, 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 blah. You know, I'm like, so I got in there to like become friends with everybody, but I also was taking photos and I took tons of photos and they were kind of cool. And I noticed they had no web presence whatsoever. So and I'm like, ah, band 101, you know, get a website, <laughs> at least where I come from. Websites aren't as crucial anymore, but, but you know what I mean? You need to kind of have your, your ducks in a row so that the internet can utilize and find you and things like that. So wound up building them a website, taking care of making sure they had a Google My Business page, like all these little things. And eventually I just started doing that for more and more people. Like, okay, let me go into my gym. And I know the owner. So I'm like, hey, I'm getting into this business now, blah, blah, blah. And I'll trade you, you know, first year for memberships. And I'll take a bunch of photos for you. And then the next year, he's like, hey, you know what I really need is a website. I'm like, well, hey, well, I do that too. So <laughs> then I just kept, by doing things like that and starting off with people I felt comfortable with, because I'm kind of an introvert and I'm not really, I'm not one of those guys that I can just walk into a business and be like, hey, I'm going to do this for you. Uh, I'm pretty timid with that sort of thing. Um, so I like to work first work with people that I'm comfortable with. If I mess up, they, they know me well enough and I'm going to fix it. So I just was able to build a portfolio. And when I was just finishing my website, uh, redoing it the other day, I was like listing the clients and stuff I'm like, damn, there's a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of people on here. I didn't even realize. I think I, I think I've made like 12 websites in the past three years wow. for businesses. So I mean, I'm staying busy but it's mainly local businesses from the area. And a lot of them at first were just friends or people I was like, you know, already utilizing their services in one way or another. And I just try to take any opportunity that I can, but I focus on that. But of course I'll still do weddings and those are good money makers and they're a great challenge. Uh, still doing work with children, whatever. Everything's on my website, kind of what we offer. So it's, it's a lot of fun and it's definitely not a boring job <laughs> or, or an easy one. <laughs> I feel like it seems, you know, something I've always kind of found fascinating and this is just kind of extra whatever might lead to an interesting conversation. You know, having a lot of friends here in the Grand Rapids area that ended up, you know, getting signed, like, you know, I'm thinking of Still Remains. Um, thinking of bands that get signed at a very young age, and more or less aren't even done growing as people and yeah. being thrown into a world where you're now expected to the thing that you were doing for fun now literally becomes a job where you're expected to make product and suddenly and, and again more to the point of like i know at 18 to probably 25 i didn't know shit but you couldn't tell me that but thinking about how I had no responsibilities, really. Like, I didn't owe anyone anything. I did, Nothing was really expected of me. But I couldn't imagine, you know, being like, oh, you're on Roadrunner, and Roadrunner tells you that you suck, and these songs are terrible, and because, you know, for whatever reason, you didn't sell enough records, now you're not getting this tour, and all this kind of stuff, and being like, man, I, 
I don't see my family. My family gives me shit. Like, all these people, like, give me shit. And now you're giving me shit. Like, what's the point of even doing this? And then it's like, why do why, do I even want to do this thing? Like, just all of the, the mental side of that stuff that, like, it does to you as you're a growing person and kind of coming into your own where really the world you're in isn't really real. And I've always thought that was kind of fascinating. Um, but there was kind of a little bit of, of that, too, like, that I wondered, you know, was it easier because you've been in, you know, doing these documentaries as long as you have to sit down and do this because it, it kind of probably felt normal to you to, to kind of put everything out there on, in a medium such as this? 100%. And, yeah, great points that you made. That's exactly, I mean, yeah, that happened. We were working on the self title and all these songs are too long. We need these short catchy songs like power trip and we're like yeah sorry we didn't write any <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh yeah that's disheartening i remember that same album self-titled um uh, came out and yeah we charted but we didn't sell as many as we had hoped to the first week and then you know the product manager says oh you should have seen, you know, what we could have spent, if we could have done, if we could have spent Ugh. more on you. And I don't think he means anything negatively, but of course we take it this way. And I mean, for all intents and purposes, Roadrunner were awesome. Like it was a dream come true to be on that label. I know in my younger days I was pretty um, anti them, but that was also kind of a culture. I mean, most of the bands we toured with were on Roadrunner, and they complained. I guess I was just the vocal one. I said it out loud. <laughs> in the press. But again, yeah. that was just the culture. I mean, I learned it from Spineshank. I learned it from El Nino. I learned it from all these bands that, at the end of the day, everyone was, you know, home with a golden ticket. We got great advances. We got tour support. We had our equipment paid for. I mean, all this stuff is awesome. But yeah, if you start to be a businessman and an accountant, you'd be like, dude, you did not sign this contract. But uh, for 20 something year old kid, come on, right. of course you're going to sign that. You know, it's a, it's, it's a dream come true. We specifically had our eyes set on Roadrunner. They were always cool to us. Um, everyone in, in the label, they supported our sound and, and us developing our own sound on our own. They didn't like impossibility when we first played that stuff for them either. And that actually pissed me off so much. Power trip was written. Um, so there you go. Like they pushed the right buttons and like one of our biggest songs comes out of it. Um, so yeah, I mean, it wasn't bad. It was just like, as we're growing, as we're getting older, as we have to start to worry about bills and have responsibility, you start doing math and you're like, wait a minute, how long am I in this contract for? <laughs> right. How many homes do I got to make till we make X? Like, wait a minute, Whoa. this isn't going to work, you know? And then you start freaking out. Yeah, I, I've always just found it fascinating that, you know, the industry kind of more or less preys on the youth of people. And not having the foresight to think, you know, five, ten years out after, you know, out. And <laughs> right. and it's like, you know, like like I said, it's like you signed the contract at 18. It's like there's a reason that you, or even younger in some instances. And it's like there's a reason you're not allowed to do certain things with our government, you know, like to hey, you can't do these things. You have to be 18 or you got to, you know, so on and so forth. It's like but it's interesting that that none of that applies to the music industry at all. <laughs> I pretty much think I. I I don't know if Chris, our keyboardist, was 18 or not, or just maybe had just turned 18. He's he's a younger, maybe he was 20 by that point. But I just remember having, sometimes we couldn't even, he couldn't drink at the bars we were playing, you know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, how did he get in? Ah, he's just a band, fuck it. Well, it's like a really weird story that I was, you know, had in doing this podcast, it's weird because sometimes I'll think of a really random question and just ask, but it's like when I was talking with Fallon from Kitty, and I go, okay, all of you started when you were, like, 13, 14, right? And she goes, yeah. And I go, where the fuck did you play? I was like, I know, like, Toronto, (laughs) like, Canada's kind of lax on shit, but, like, legitimately, like, what places are letting four middle school-age kids come in or, you know, maybe freshmen or whatever? But it's like, 
I can't think of anywhere where that would be okay. <laughs> she goes, right. yeah, that's I funny. never thought of that. And I go, oh, well, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I just thought it was very weird that it's like, oh, we, we were playing bars and we were doing this. It's like at like your early teens, you guys are playing bars. Like that's very, it's <laughs> very weird. That doesn't happen. <laughs> right. No, you're totally right. Um, um, it was a fascinating time. Yeah. Um, kind of been wrapping up though. Um, you know, everyone, I, I gotta say that I, w- I was so on the fence about going to that Chimera Christmas, but it was just like financially just couldn't make it happen. But after seeing the stage production that you guys put behind it, I was like, fuck, I really should have gone to that. Like how fun was it to, to finally play a show with like that much production? Cause I, I mean, I saw you guys on the last, one of the last tours you did with, uh, with Unearth and Skeleton, which I think was the other band it was. And then, obviously, the Dirt Fest show you played, and then I think shortly thereafter you guys kind of called it a day. But I don't think I've ever seen that much stage production from you guys, even on a headlining set. Oh, yeah, never. I mean, we, we pulled out some stuff before at the Christmas show. We we definitely have done video and things like that, but nothing to that scale. Like, I think Camera Christmas 10, our video, the extent of it was, white sheet in the background and some projector stuff with a few things here and there, maybe a static logo, but this was so advanced. Chris and I spent probably six months doing all the video content and which forced us, this is going to get nerdy, but all the the music musicians out there will get a kick out of it. It forced us for the first time in our career to play to a click track. (laughs) <laughs> and because we could I was he was editing the video that it could be done a certain way I guess it could be played a little looser uh-huh. and then I started getting way like specific like this hit has to, you know and he's like I'm not gonna be able to play that <laughs> we're gonna have to play to a, you know we're gonna have to play to a click this was like a week before the show we discovered we we're like no it's it's mandatory. Like click has to happen. Like there's no way out of it. The, the, excuse me, the week before the show is the first time we ever played and and to a click and it was just going horrible. Like we, we try to play the video and sync up to it and the click would be just way off and everything would throw off and then band have to stop. And here's our first practice, you know, like, what a buzzkill. Uh, it just, it, I'm just, I, I still think Rob is upset <laughs> from that first day. <laughs> like he was so bummed, you know, and for good reason, like we're here to practice, not fucking have video, you know? Right. Um, so he, he, he's every right, but, I, it, but Chris and I were like, Oh my God, we spent six months on this. It has to fucking work. <laughs> it's going to look so crazy. So, you know, we we did our best to get everything lined up and tight. And by the third day, we were rolling, you know. Um, but, yeah, for, for those the people that don't know what a click track is and what I'm talking about, it's basically we're playing to a metronome. And we've never in our career, except for at the, in, in the studio, right. played to one of these. So it's it's very unfamiliar for us. But we, we pull it off. You know, it was curse, another curse of it sound check day of the show we can't get uh, austin's in ears to play the click properly without <laughs> disruption I, I mean the universe was saying man fuck the video just jam right <laughs> but uh like we didn't even get a proper sound check so of course any musician knows without a, a good sound check especially if you're headlining you come out you have no idea what you're going to get that can be really frustrating when you're just trying to rip right off the bat and you can't hear yourself or you can't hear the things you need to hear. Um, so if there, it wasn't without blunder, that's for sure, but all of our efforts somehow, uh, they they managed to pull off. We pulled it off and it was giant LED screens and elaborate video and a crazy light show and uh, like, I don't even know, I think 17 songs or something. We played a crazy set list. So we definitely played it like it would be, hey, if that's our last one, let's go out on a bang, you know? I feel like 
You know, you know, I was talking with with Max Cavalera earlier today, and and some of the conversations I've been having with some of the people lately. A common theme has been these anniversary reunion shows. You know, I just talked to John from Pitch Shifter. They're doing these reunion shows of PitchShifter dot com record. Um, you know, Max obviously did that nail bomb. You know, first album or the only nail bomb record. Uh, tour and all that kind of stuff you know and i'd kind of asked him like oh it's 20 years of the first record like why didn't you do that at this point with uh chimera obviously being i never know if hiatus is the word because it seems like you know everyone leaves the book open the door open just slightly in case like eh, you know might do something but something that kind of intrigued me and made me wonder if there was potentially some more down the road was the fact that you guys still had your rehearsal space. Because to me, typically when a band's done, you don't keep the, <laughs> the rehearsal space. <laughs> like, I know that's a really weird thing to, to latch on to because, like, when the, when I realized in the documentary you guys were going to the rehearsal, I was like, oh, I'm interested to see where they go because by the time you guys did um, – one of the last records, like, and you guys had expanded that sound room that in the very, in the impossibility of reason DVD was so meager that I was like, wow, it looks like they bought like the next, like four spaces next to them, tore down the walls, expanded and made this really nice rehearsal space. <laughs> and so when I saw that you guys were still there, I was like, okay, so who the fuck is keeping, who's still paying for that? Uh, and having all of the, the flags and the banners and so forth and the scrims and so forth. I was like, it just seems weird that someone would keep that space for a f- band that doesn't exist anymore. Well, I love a juicy conspiracy theory <laughs> and, and, and you're hitting all the right things, right? You, 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 yeah, you check this, you check that, you check this. Ah, but there's, there's something non nefarious at foot. <laughs> uh, Rob just kept the space. He turned it into a recording studio, and oh, okay. he records bands. That's what he does. So it's actually converted now into a recording studio, and we were kind of crammed into a little space of it. Ah, okay. And uh, so it's pretty cool, um, but it is the same one. He stayed in there. He just put out a new album as well. Uh, it's band The Elite with Austin as well, and... He recorded that there, and he's a great ear, always has had one, and always has been into production. I remember right when we first met for Chimera, he had shown me a multi-track recorder that he had and stuff he'd made himself. I'm like, wow, that's sweet. So like, that means we can record our own demos in the practice space. And it kind of led to that, so I know he's always, since I've known him, been in into recording so it just seemed like a very logical thing to do and he definitely had the space for it that's what he's up to fair enough i, I know that was a very weird thing to have oh, noticed not weird at all. I love it. It, <laughs> it reminded me of like conspiracy theories on the internet you're like pointing out all the the right things but there's this this one thing you just don't know (laughs) right well that's like you know watching these i've now illuminated you to the the truth you are you have reached the level my friend (laughs) there we are um in closing you know with the documentary as serious as this is uh with the subject matter and the fact that you guys made it free i think speaks to the fact that you want it to be seen by as many people as possible what do you hope now that it's out there? What and it's basically no longer yours, uh, you know, just like everything. Once you put it out there, it's out of your your hands. But what do you hope this the longevity of this this uh, documentary does? I, I hope it sparks a conversation and a different type of conversation than we're used to having, where. Uh, um, it's kind of like I mentioned, like the, that intervention train wreck style is what we're used to, or even worse, like the suicides. And uh, I think we're like uh, the conversation we're used to having is a darker one. And this is n- not so dark, and it's a little more heartfelt and a little more like, eh, you know, this is the this is how you, how one person deals with that. And it's allegorical. It could be any artist. It could be any way that they're using something, turning a negative into a positive. So I think just having a different kind of conversation is our goal. And that's where I think 
you know, see where, see where that takes us. Where does that, where does that conversation lead us to? It would be interesting. Most definitely. And uh, lastly, where can everyone find you and the the movie itself? If you go to downagainfilm.com, F-I-L-M, as in movie, film, you'll find everything. You can find the press that we're doing behind the, the stuff like this. We link to all of it. You can find our personal websites which help you get in contact with either me or the director, Nick. Of course, you can see the film. And for those asking to see the full versions of the songs, they're on the, the media player in there. So you can hear the full version of Nothing Remains or the full version of Town Again, which in the movie, you only hear bits. We haven't put up pictures in the gold room yet because we want to kind of wait for a little more people to see it because that's kind of a moment in the film that I think, and I don't want to spoil that, I suppose. (laughs) So we're going to wait for a little bit before we release that, maybe like another week or so. But yeah, you can kind of find everything there and get to us there. That's down again, film. If you forget the word film, you're going to line up at some dude's LinkedIn page, which is, he beat us, fucking guy. Uh, and I'll show Chimera, fuck that band. <laughs> I'm going to direct y'all to my LinkedIn page. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so downagainfilm.com. And, yeah, reach out. I'm not unapproachable. Like, I love it when fans reach out or send messages or hire me to just shoot their wings. It's totally cool. $5,000. <laughs> you know, it actually, you, you uh, I don't remember if it actually is pictures in the, in the Golden Room. That, is that... Shit, is that the one that was inspired? No, it was The Flame, wasn't it, that was inspired by Twin Peaks? Yes. Uh, Pictures in the Gold Room is The Shining. And, okay, that's right. And Fire Walk With Me is The Flame, yeah, Twin Peaks. So I know, obviously, there's been the continuation of the series, uh, Twin Peaks. Oh, have, yeah. you, have you written anything inspired by that viewing of, of the new stuff? Man, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. <laughs> have you seen it? Uh, I only made it through like two episodes, and then we we canceled uh, our subscription to uh, to was it Showtime? Showtime. Oh my goodness! So, so let me tell you how involved I got into that series when it was airing. I watched so we would record them. I, I watched them as they aired. Uh, that was crucial for me. Um, I watched them as they aired, and we also then had the on-demand access. So we would watch it at night then wake up the next morning and watch it again. And usually around mid-afternoon or maybe a day or two later, there was a YouTube channel of this dude that they like would dissect each scene <laughs> and kind of break down what he thought was going on. And so you're like really absorbing that episode then. Then I would go on to the Reddit Twin Peaks forum and read every fucking comment <laughs> and every post. Then I would watch the episode again before the next one would air. air. <laughs> <laughs> so I was pretty invested and involved in that series to the point of pretty much insanity. Um, so where's your podcast yeah. at then for this? Yeah, I know. I know. I need to I don't have any friends that are nerdy enough, I guess. I, I, I got to find them. Maybe that's where I, that's a good idea. Start and talk about nerdy shit like that, and maybe then they just come. If you build it, they will come. I exactly. By now. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I don't have one, but I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fan. I'm a, a super nerd. I've actually been to Snoqualmie Falls uh, ten, at least. When, when, no, it was 2001 I went um, when we were on tour with Danzig. This is where they filmed the hotel and mm-hmm. the and the waterfall and all that. And I went to every location because it's in the city for the most part, except for the built sets, which were in LA. But I went to the diner. I had coffee, cherry pie. I am a fucking <laughs> geek. So yeah, I get involved. If I like something, I don't, I'm not like a mild fan of anything. I, <laughs> I get obsessed. <laughs> do you think they left it to where it's, it's done or do you envision another limited series run coming? Uh, I really don't, only in the sense that I think that the age and time are against us in that regard. 
Right. But one could be hopeful. I was fine. I was, I was more than happy with the ending. I guess my interpretation is like, I'm, they're stuck in a different parallel universe now. Okay, cool. Like, <laughs> I'm okay with that. You know, I mean, there's definitely esoteric bookends you can look at and all the theories that go on. And yes, you could keep it going, but I, I was totally satisfied. I like, I have no urge to see anymore. Whereas before, you know, I'm like, man, you're kind of hopeful for it, I guess. Right. I haven't gone to a Twin Peaks fest yet, so I'm not that I'm not that geeked out. But I did look at tickets. That's that's where you're going to find your co-host for your podcast. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so is it worth the investment to be able to nerd out in detail for hours and hours with somebody else about this? I think so. I mean, I could talk like this is kind of stuff I like talking about, right? So why not? I like talking about movies. I like talking about. Uh, especially eighties action. Like, you get me on that stuff. Like I was just talking with uh Max and the Soulfly Eleven, the song series they do on every record to end the albums. This one uh has like a bit of saxophone, and the whole huh. time, like I, I told him, I was like, "Dude, I hope you don't take this the wrong way." But all I can think of is like the beginning opening sequence to like Lethal Weapon, and I was like immediately <laughs> loving it. And he goes, "Yeah, oh, man, I love the Lethal Weapon movies. Fuck yeah, like that's awesome." And I was like, "All right, <laughs> like cool," because the whole time I was like, "Oh man, I could just what what are Mergs or uh, Riggs and Murtaugh getting into this this one?" Like <laughs> it was just so funny. And uh, how, how about how about this Lethal Weapon trivia? Did you do you know? I'll keep you going before I. Spoiler. Um, do you know who uh, Mur- Murtaugh's house? Do you know who else's house that is in another film? I can see it in my head because I can think of the fight between Gary Busey and, and Mel Gibson in the front lawn after they busted right. the thing. Right. Ah, fuck. Um,. I know as soon as you say it, I'm gonna be like, "Oh, yep, there it is." No, yeah. I've I've always I've always known that it looked familiar, and I just never could place my finger on it. No, I don't I don't I don't know off the top of my head. Todd and Margot, they are next to the Griswold Fuck. Christmas that's vacation it. home. Yep. <laughs> well, that's like I got really excited uh, yesterday. We were watching The Resident, um, and. One of the guys that was in it for a guest appearance was, uh, I don't know if you like, probably do not watch Gilmore Girls, and I don't fault you for that. Um, I so, seen it. Something my wife got me into, but it's very quick dialogue. It's, <laughs> it's almost reminiscent of like a Kevin Smith-esque kind of thing, the way the, the writers write the dialogue. And uh, But one of the guys that was in, in that is the main character in this show, and then one of the other ancillary characters was a guest in this one i was like oh that's cool but the cooler thing to me because i'm on my like third viewing of fraser right now on netflix is daphne's all of a sudden and i was like holy shit that's so fucking cool because <laughs> I, I i still think fraser is probably one of the greatest sitcoms of like of all time my that was my mom's favorite for sure uh, she uh she loved it i was i'm more uh, more of a seinfeld guy oh well, I mean, era. yeah uh, but I mean, who isn't but yeah I, I need to revisit Frasier because I think at the time uh, the humor didn't speak to me, whereas I I could imagine that now where I am in life, it, I'd probably find it hilarious. It's just, I don't know, like there was, kept, speaking of Kevin Smith, him and uh, Matt Myra from X Nerdist Podcast had a Frasier podcast that didn't last very long where they basically talked about everything but the episode they were watching. But <laughs> in it, you know, they got uh, Ted Levine on and he was talking about how, you know, they broke this, the show structure down, like, in the first, I think he said before, like, the first commercial break, you've got all your main characters on the show. We always said it in one of these three settings right away. Like, just, like, things you don't notice, but you're like, oh, fuck, well, that's why this show is so fucking good. Because, like, they have, they figured out a formula. But then, like he was saying, it's like, well, we piggybacked off of Cheers because... Obviously, right. Frazier came from Cheers, so we kind of had sure. already figured out what works, and we're able to just input this formula into this other show, and it's like, man, and then it's like, you know, when they start talking about how Kelsey Grammer played the same character for, like, 20 years on TV continuously, yeah. it's like, holy shit, like, that just doesn't happen. No, you're right, and that's, yeah, it's, it's remarkable. I uh, I got to revisit it for sure. You yeah. inspired me. Okay, and then, for real, last question. I uh, always like to end these episodes out to a song, so what would you like me to play it out to and maybe a, a little story as to why you chose it? Okay, 
So, uh, one second here. Making some chicken wings here. Joey Diaz, blue cheese, blue cheese with wings or go fuck your mother. <laughs> um, the, uh, so, okay, we're going to play a song called Children of the New Dawn, and it's by Johan Johansson, and it's on the Mandy soundtrack. And if that's if you have capability of doing that, it's on Spotify and all that. Okay. Um, so why the Mandy soundtrack? Ah, it's an inside joke. I liked the movie quite a bit. It's a new horror movie. With yeah, I was just saying. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's just it's off the it's off the rocker. And uh, Nick, the director of Down Again, very much disliked it. So we've been <laughs> kind of teasing each other back and forth. And if he listens to this interview. He can just start laughing because here I am trolling him by yeah. promoting Mandy and Ma- the Mandy soundtrack. Knowing full well, he'll be like, "Damn it! I like the soundtrack. I like the cinematography. He didn't like the the, the directing." <laughs> so, have you seen? Well, troll him a little bit. <sighs> Who the fuck did it? Was it? It wasn't Vice because it's a very Vice thing they would have done. <sighs> fuck! I don't remember who did it. I'll leave you with this. Somewhere on YouTube, it's a new thing that just came out. It might have been like someone like Vice. It's it's a publication, a, a pretty re- reputable one at that. They sat down with Nick Cage to go over every one of his film roles. <laughs> and I got to see this. Oh yeah, and the fact that and I might be getting this wrong, but I don't think so since I just rewatched it not that long ago, or listened to it, I should say. He basically said that the inspiration for his role in Mandy was that from oh, what the fuck was that vampire movie that shitty vampire movie mm. like one of his first it's movies a lot. I know oh 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 one of his first movies yeah, yeah 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 one of Nick Cage's first movies where he's like where he thinks he's a vampire oh what the fuck the is fuck that is movie that? called <laughs> oh man I'm drawing a blank too uh Google I can only real see fast him as a burger guy at <laughs> Fast Times at Ridgemont High right now right <laughs> Hell of a time um, to take a break, Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm telling my brain right now. Uh, Nick Cage vampire movie. What did you know? I am DB, and thank God for Google because uh, vampires yeah, kiss. No, no. Vampires kiss. Oh, okay, okay. I think okay. he was saying that the inspiration for his his role in this, either that or it was uh, another great movie, Con Air. I think he was saying one of the two, though, because I, I like I said, I've just listened to it, and I just I think it's fascinating because I. He can either be really great or he's just fucking way out there and there's not much middle ground. But he was right. saying that basically Vampire's Kiss was his first, you know, attempt at trying to be able to play a character that was larger than life and all this kind of other stuff. And he just went with it and hasn't been challenged since Vampire's Kiss. <laughs> and I think he was saying that about Mandy, which makes more sense because Con Air was a pretty reserved role by comparison. But it's yeah. it's just one of those where it's like, Nick Cage, I... I Man, that man should have his own podcast or a reality show or something. Oh, yeah. That'd be amazing. I think uh, one of his home runs was Joe. Did you see that movie? Uh, it sounds really oh, familiar. Joe. That one was a home run for me with him. And then I thought it was interesting. Like, cause that movie, Joe, he plays like a guy that cuts down trees. And then in the first scene in Mandy, he's a guy that's cutting down trees. <laughs> no, you know, the home run movie for me that was so under the radar was uh weatherman. I didn't see that one. Holy that's, shit. That's under my radar. So there's, this doesn't spoil anything per se, but he's giving a speech and he goes, when I think of my dad, I think of the song, like a rock by Bob Seger. And then mm-hmm. something happens, and then his dad and him are taking a ride, and then he just his dad starts playing. Who was played? Oh, by the way, his dad's uh, oh, fuck, I can't remember his name. The dude who plays Alfred in uh the Batman trilogy, the Nolan trilogy. Oh, Michael Caine. Yeah, his dad's Michael Caine, uh, which explained that. But regardless, um, and his dad plays the song, and he goes, "I've been listening to the song. I don't know. I don't understand. <laughs> I don't get it." <laughs> and he goes, "Well, I didn't get to finish my speech." <laughs> Uh, and then he talks about how no one fucks with him anymore. And then he's like, it's probably because I also carry a bow and arrow around with me everywhere. It's just so fucking weird. And uh, it's so good. It's so good. And like, apparently no one saw it, but it's a, it's a fucking weird sort of comedy drama 
thing. I don't even know, but it, it is, it's a great under the radar Nick Cage movie. And I will leave you with that. Out. So All right. we I both have our homework it. to do. And thank you again for taking the time. Sorry we went way over the uh, the allotted oh, no, time. No worries. And, Any, uh, anytime. I appreciate I appreciate the time, and I look forward to having uh, everyone listen to it. Yeah, awesome. Well, enjoy the rest of your night, man, and uh, have a great week. You too. Take care. Thanks. So that was my conversation with Mark Hunter of Chimera going over uh, Down Again documentary, which is out now. Uh, you can go and check that out at downagainfilm.com. Don't go to downagain.com because you're going to go to someone's LinkedIn profile. <laughs> no, I thought that was really cool. And, uh, you know, it's kind of funny. I, I didn't know if I was going to leave in the, the tail end there where uh, Mark and I just start talking about Twin Peaks and movies <laughs> and all that stuff. But, you know, I thought, yeah, it's an extra, like, 10, 15 minutes of bullshit that doesn't have anything to do with anything. But I thought it was just a lot of fun and kind of shows uh, the side of Mark that – you know, I don't think we ever really saw on like any of those DVDs. Like, I mean, I think you see it if you follow him on Twitter and so forth. Like, you know, these other things he's passionate about and that he can be funny and all these things. But I, I thought that was the kind of thing. You know, we talked about some serious shit and some really interesting things. But I thought that that would kind of like end it on a more less serious tone. Yeah, yeah, it was kind of nice seeing that side of it because I mean, sometimes it's fun just hearing dudes nerd out about something that they like. And, uh, you know, especially when you're doing these interviews and you haven't talked to somebody ever you know, before, <laughs> but like it, there's a certain, I mean, just, it was just like whenever you and I first started talking, John, it was one of those, like, we talk for a while and then it's like, wait a minute. And we find something we have in common and it's like, did we just become best friends? Right. You know, like, <laughs> and so that's that, uh, no, that I thought that was cool. I definitely, if I'd have had control over like the editing of that episode of that interview, I'd have been like, yeah, oh yeah, leave that in for sure. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what, what fans think. Um, so, you know, a lot of times when we do these intros and outros, um, we tend to stick pretty heavily to the actual episode itself. Um, sometimes I feel like it's just, you know, it, it kind of keeps it all self-referential and contained and kind of gives you, like, our opinions on these things. Um then it doesn't date the episode so bad, you know, if you listen to these well after the fact. But, um, you know, I wanted to kind of bring up something that I thought was uh, – affected me a little bit more than I thought it was going to upon the news hitting. Um, but this week, as of when we're recording right now, uh, a few days ago, Oli Herbert from uh, All That Remains ended up passing away. Yeah. And, you know, Dan sent me the – a screenshot of the the news breaking and I, I was you know very taken aback because i mean like i told dan literally when i was in the room with uh phil doing that interview from like a month or so ago um Oli was just sitting in the room with us the whole time um so at the end when the mics were off and all that kind of stuff you know i, I got to say hello real quick and introduce myself and uh it's just it's very weird to literally have been in a room with somebody and interacting with them and, you know, uh, uh, to of that level. And, you know, here we are less than you know a month removed or so. And the other, like, really weird thing about it timing-wise is I actually had just got done doing a, a, an interview with uh, Aaron from All That Remains. Um, shit, Dan, what, like probably three days, four days? Not three, even... three days tops. Yeah. And, you know, it's like we didn't talk about the new record really a whole lot just because, you know, obviously – can't really talk about it yet um so i mean I, i've kind of been entrenched a little bit in all that remains stuff and and keeping up with you know everything that's been going on with those guys so to to kind of have this happen just kind of hit me a little bit out of nowhere and you know the thing that i think is very interesting um about this this whole thing is you know in the day and age of the internet you know everybody leading up to you you know, me inadvertently breaking the news that All That Remains had a new record, it was done, it was recorded, and it was coming out. Uh, and then a few weeks later, here come the album teasers and so forth. You know, all I saw was people shit-talking Phil, shit-talking the band, all this kind of stuff. And kind of surprisingly, when the news of Oli hit, overwhelmingly everything was positive. And... I'm not used to seeing that on the internet. Yeah, in in cases of death, I mean, I I feel like shit, dude. In the past couple of years, we've been the, the especially the heavy music community has been experiencing more death 
than I can think of in a concentrated period of time. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's getting, it's getting outrageous. And again, I don't think the circumstances uh, of his passing were, were shared. Not yet. Not as anything. And, um, and I'm, I try really hard not to be the kind of person that when I hear news like that and don't immediately be like, well, well, from what? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it is human nature. I mean, we, we, we're all thinking it, whether we actually say it or don't say it. But uh, I think in this case, it was uh, it was interesting to see that everybody kind of came together and, you know, took this news for, with the weight that it deserved. And um, it's a huge loss, man. Like, I, I'm not going to get, like, too choked up or emotional about it, but, like, it, it's a huge loss to our community. And, you know, I, I, I hope... I sincerely hope that 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 these these deaths that have been taking place lately are kind of a little bit of a wake up call for some some of the way like the amount of the amount of discouragement that these guys get on a daily basis from the internet from fan you know from fans quote unquote fans yeah and um you know like you said you know they had great news we're putting out a new record it was like Phil's a piece of shit yeah immediately you know and it's like you know and again i don't know if that has anything to do with 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 uh with his death in particular uh ollie's death but it's definitely um been a factor i think for some people that have passed recently and i think that uh it really i really hope that it that it's a wake-up call for people to just kind of maybe we need to appreciate what we've got whether you think that the newest all that remains record is great or, or or it sucks or it's butt rock or whatever you know because i mean i i'm i'm pretty much a professional music shit talker you know <laughs> but um whenever the attacks get personal like that's that's the part where you have to draw the line and be like you know you're allowed to have your opinion or whatever but like to the lengths that people go to attack people and you know send dms and stuff i mean like even i get dms of people that are like your show sucks you suck you should quit you know, stuff like that. And I don't get it all the time, but if I was more popular, I would, you right. know, that's just the nature of the beast. Um, but you know, I, I, I do have to say that it's, if anything good can be gleamed out of this is that everybody kind of came together and was very positive and supportive. And I think, I think the, the heavy music scene as a whole needs a lot more of that. But, um, kind of in wrapping up, Actually, if you haven't seen the documentary, you can go to downagainfilm.com and see it. Uh, there are links to all the different uh, interviews Mark and everyone has done in regards to the film. Uh, basically, like a nice uh, tree link uh, to everything, all the socials, all the links to the live footage of the videos. As you heard Mark say, there's probably going to be uh, pictures, in the, pictures in the Golden Room coming out soon. Um, but yeah, and if you'd like to keep up with Mark, uh, you can. F- I mean, if you want to find him on Facebook, it's not hard. Uh, just search his name. Um, I don't know if he'll accept you. Can't speak to that. If you would like to follow him on Instagram, you can find him at Mark Hunter Photo. And if you would like to follow him on Twitter, simply Chimera Mark. And uh, Dan, where can people find you? Uh, well, you can find me on uh, Twitter at Discuss Metal Dan. And uh, I will accept you if you follow me. I will follow you back. <laughs> and uh, you can find my other podcast discography discussion at DiscussMetal.com. And you can also find me on Facebook at Plain Old Regular Daniel Terry. And if you would like to keep up with our show partner, Moshpit Nation, you can do such at MoshpitNation.com. Facebook is Moshpit Nation, West Capital MI. Twitter and Instagram are simply Moshpit Nation. If you would like to follow our show sponsor, The Bean Bastard, you can over at TheBeanBastard.com. Facebook and Instagram are simply The Bean Bastard. Looks like uh, The Bean One is getting yet another facelift. Uh... Very excited to uh, to see this thing in person, take some photos, and it's almost like a celebrity at this point. Like I'm like, oh my god, the Rickmobile is in town, but no, it's the Bean One. I'm gonna go take photos of it and all that kind of stuff. But uh, looking forward to that. Uh, maybe I'll do a quick interview with Nick while I'm down there in Buffalo in a couple of months. Um, but yeah, go give those guys a follow. Go to BeanBastard.com, get some coffee, delicious coffee, a foot, a brewing, as it were. And if you would like to keep up with all things the podcast, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at John's Entitled Podcast. And tweet at us at John's Entitled Pod and email us at John's Entitled Pod at gmail.com. 
Dan's going to tell you about rating, reviewing, and subscribing and why we need to do it. Rating, reviewing, and subscribing are the three magical steps that helps a podcast become successful. And as awesome as John and I are on a daily basis, we still kind of need your help to help us be successful so if you love this podcast and you listen every time we post an episode go on whatever podcast app you have leave us a review leave us whatever kind of review you think we deserve and uh, we will appreciate that review and we will take whatever kind of criticism you may have if you have no criticism that's even better just leave us a review and uh you know ratings are important they help us come up in search results help us uh get put into recommendation algorithms and uh just overall makes us feel like cool guys like we're not just wasting our time doing this so uh rating reviewing and subscribing definitely the best thing you can do for a podcast uh other than send us money want to say thanks to everyone who has rated and reviewed uh currently still a five-star rated podcast so that's good but yeah, Dan made a comment about uh, supporting us monetarily. If you would like to sponsor the show, email us, johnsontitlepod at gmail.com. Uh, we've got some great guests, uh, as you have seen over the last handful of months. Um, we make those headlines, baby. So people can uh, potentially see your thing, whatever it is you want to promote. Uh, we'll be in these episodes as well. And uh, if you would like to support the podcast financially in a different way, you can head over to patreon.com slash johnsontitlepodcast. And uh, throw us some some dineros. And uh, once again, I'm going to go ahead and shout out uh, Sarah Schneider for being a a loyal patron. Uh, She's enjoying those bonus episodes we put up over there. And uh, you can too. And with all that being said, we are going to end this episode as we always do to a song. And as you heard Mark pick, he wants to troll Mr. Nick Cavalier, the director of Down Again, by playing Johan Johansson's song Children of the New Dawn. (laughs) <laughs> from the new Mandy movie. I don't know if, Dan, have you seen that movie? No, I have not. Oh, boy. And for a treat. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so we're going to end it out to Children of the New Dawn by Johan Johansson, and uh, we will talk to you guys next time. <laughs>